Hey everybody, it's time to get back into some architecture, um, especially the architecture of the Italian High Renaissance. So we're finally going to meet uh, Bramante, the, the one High Renaissance artist who um, didn't get a teenage mutant ninja turtle named after him. Oh well, I don't think he's going to. In hindsight, if he even knows, he's probably not going to care in the least. Uh, but in any event, let's go ahead and pivot to our PowerPoint here and we'll get going. Um, we're also going to get into um, another surprising architect that I'm sure you didn't expect to make such a huge impact um, on the High Renaissance as well. So here we go. Uh, very good. All right, we're moving on to our PowerPoint here and we are meeting Ramonte. Ramonte um, is known for a building that's rather petite, really. Um, if you were to walk into that door of his building called the Tempietto, which basically means little temple, it would just be about 15 feet in diameter from one end to the other. It's not really meant to be um, a useful space. Um, it's not a place of worship. Um, it's a memorial uh, that marks the location of where St. Peter was crucified. Um, so it's a very holy location, and this um, was a commission, actually, um, uh, that happened in 1502 from uh, Ferdinand Isabella, of, of, um, that you may have heard of from Spain, who commissioned this as kind of a gift uh, to the city of Rome. So it's not at the Vatican either, which is, we're just in Rome itself. Uh, what you find here is Bramante as a humanist um, is going to look to uh, classical world sources for his inspiration for the Tempietto. He's also, as I've written here, ushering in a sculptural treatment to architecture, and I'll explain where you can see that in just a minute. Let's go over a little bit of um, some architectural lingo for you. Um, as we move forward here with our slides. Oh, first of all, let me show you an image of uh, a big source of uh, the Tempietto's um, inspiration. Bramante uh, became uh, aware that uh, something the Romans did uh, was create in temples in the round. Uh, you might be familiar with some of the examples I've been showing you of Traditional Greek temples were usually kind of rectangular in shape, uh, four-sided, quadrilateral shapes. Um, but then you get to the Romans and they start to experiment um, and branch out into this round temple format. And this introduces a new concept into the architect's mind of the central plan design. Uh, the central plan design it's very easy to recognize. Often it's something as fundamental as the building being ground, but sometimes it can mean that it has sort of um, a balance and symmetry capped by a dome-like structure. And we'll see a few examples in our next uh, few units in, in this class on the High Renaissance. All right, moving on here, uh, back to the Tempietto, another view here um, in a little bit of better lighting. Here's some architectural lingo. The stylobate is something you would find on a classical world temple. So this is something Bramante is reviving from his humanist studies. It's a stepped uh, elevated platform, almost like a raised foundation. The balustrade, that might be a term you've heard of. It's this kind of railing you see on this kind of upstairs balcony that encircles um, that upper level. You see those on fancy hotels and uh, mansions, that kind of thing all the time. The drum and dome, uh, whenever you have a building that's circular, um, you reference that as the drum of the building. And then of course, we're all familiar with what a dome is that caps the top of this extended drum. All right, moving on here. What, uh, so we see classical world ingredients. Uh, we see um, a, a colonnade of columns wrapping around the lower level of the Tempietto. Um, there are cornices um, as well um, present um, on the Tempietto, and of course, the style of eight. We talked about that being a re an, a, an approach that's a revival. But what's interesting about the style of eight is that it sort of mimics 
um, the pedestal a statue would stand of. So if you can remember in your mind, Michelangelo's statue of David, David, um, of course, is a very large statue, but has even more presence by being positioned on an elevated pedestal. So in many ways, the Tempietto is statue-like, the way it is, is positioned on a pedestal, but it's really a style of age, if you understand what I'm saying. The other thing that's sculptural about it is, you know, when you look at the buildings that came later that kind of crowded in that space in a unflattering way. Um, this was not part of the original intent. This is a, a later era that encroached around the Tempietto. Um, but what you see here is if these were just, you know, we can take in those buildings at a glance. They're not extraordinary. They don't have a lot of texture. They have a few windows, but once we kind of understand those elements, their repetition, repetitious, so we just sort of glance and ignore from that point forward these buildings. The Tempietto, Bramante wanted us to have something that held our attention quite a bit longer. So he sculpts out, if I can use that term in this architectural project, elements to create niches of shadow. So there are regular intervals of kind of rectangular shapes and then sort of um, scallop elements in this oval shaped niche. Sometimes you, you have an actual window or a door, uh, but whether above or below, he's playing with this because it plays with shadow and light. Um, as you can see, the recessed spaces uh, capture shadow. The, the exterior of the drum of the building reflects light. So it creates this kind of shadow and light rhythm that moves your eye around um, the Tempietto below and above. Down below, it's a little bit more work for your eye because your eye has to even kind of thread through and between each column uh, to take in our understanding and appreciation of that lower level. So it's sculptural in that regard. It is dynamic because it makes your eye work um, and focus on the building um, and this play of light and shadow um, in tandem with uh, the revival of the Roman round temple central plan design um, will have a huge everlasting impact um, in the Renaissance and Baroque periods and beyond as well. Moving on now to a project that came, that was awarded to Bramante. And you don't have to write down the details on this coin, but they were so excited about it that when he uh, drew up his plans for this project, they even uh, minted a coin to honor it. And that was to uh, rebuild um, and create a new, larger, more magnificent St. Peter's uh, Basilica or church. Remember, we might have met uh, old St. Peter's already. Um, this dates way back to the 300s. This is truly the early Christian days. This was the church um, in the location we now know as Vatican City, and it, it represents the traditional um, early Christian architecture uh, based on the Latin cross, you can see if you were a little bird flying over the building, there is a very um, strong reminder of the crucifix um, above that. It had a little foreground courtyard as well. It was small, it was prone to fire because of its wood timber roof, and the popes in the high renaissance were like, we need to take it down and build something that really underscores the Vatican as the seat of the Christian church, um, and to, of course, practically speaking, accommodate the, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of more uh, Christians, the millions of Christians that have, of, you know, um, that have uh, come to the faith since uh, the 300s. So uh, the plan was, again, to tear down old St. Peter's, and build a new church. Well, uh, Bramante drew up the plans, which you can see here on the left, and I'll make my face disappear so you can see some of the details of the slide, and then he died. 
Oh no. So the plans were uh, drawn up in 1505. It took 40 years almost for the project to get traction again. And that's when they hired none other than Michelangelo. Is there anything this guy can't do? He can sculpt, he can paint, and now he is an architect of this enormous church that's going to become the most famous church, um, um, at least in Europe, if not the world. All right, looking at the plans here, you can see they're very similar. You can see Michelangelo taking great inspiration from Bramante. And what you find with Bramante is a revival of the central plan design continuing in his plans for St. Peter. So it's still a cross fundamentally, but it's a cross with equal arms. And the circle in the middle is the dome that caps it. That underscores that central plan design. It also underscores his humanist studies of the uh, symmetry and repetition of ratios and ingredients that we met with Brunelleschi and Alberti is now consider it's now continuing in the architecture of the high renaissance with a cross of uh, arms of equal length smaller crosses in each corner but fairly busy uh, it looks almost like honeycomb doesn't it contained within a uh, exterior kind of footprint or perimeter of a square or quadrilateral Moving to Michelangelo's, you can see he kind of got rid of some of that busyness and opened up the corridors for traffic and visual lines of sight. He's also getting rid of this boxy square exterior and creating an undulating exterior that's very sculptural. He created also a row of columns to create an entrance that's different than a Bramante's. Um, and keep in mind, again, if you cut either plan in half from top to bottom or left to right, you get these symmetrical halves, these kind of mirror image um, halves that um, reflect Renaissance humanist values in uh, balance and symmetry and harmony and beauty. Moving on now to uh, the architectural plan of St. Peter. You can see Michelangelo's enormous dome. Let's move on to what it looks like outside. Now, if you were to pop over to, to Vatican City, um, you would only see Michelangelo's famous church from the back because other improvements will come along in the next century. But here is that enormous dome. Here is the central plan design fundamentally in the original High Renaissance version. And here's that undulating exterior. But you can see the enormous scale compared to these apartment buildings and office buildings adjacent to this. You can see lots of um, classical world architectural fe features as well as Alberti's colossal order of pilasters. This is something that Michelangelo admired and revived and brought into his uh, design of St. Peter's Basilica, so that the eye not only moves horizontally following that very sculptural undulating, undulating line that plays with shadow and light. He's also sculpting away niches and creating windows and doors to play with shadow and light. You can see he's learned a few things from Bramante, but the colossal order of pilasters also sends our eye vertically up um, to this little upper level space, they call that the attic, and of course, ultimately to the, the topper, this enormous do uh, dome that Michelangelo created that would have been seen, for, you know, visible for miles um, all over Rome. So there you have it, a massive church to really solidify the authority, the grandeur, um, and the power of uh, the Vatican during the Italian High Renaissance, thanks to Bramante, but finished and ultimately taken to um, its uh, remarkable enduring status by Michelangelo.